Hello everyone and welcome to um, the fourth of our Apprentice Makers Live sessions. Um, today we're going to be talking about the hospitality um, sector and we have um, Ros um, Hardman on the line and we've got Aideen on the line and they are going to talk through how apprenticeships have worked in their business. Um, before we do that, I thought it might be useful for me to run through a few things that we're doing with Apprentice Makers so that you can find out how it might be relevant for your business or for your organisation and can think of ways in which to get involved because we're very keen to work in partnership and to um, encourage organisations to, um, to think about how they could use Apprentice Makers for some of the activities that they're working on as well. Okay, so I'll run through that and then I'll hand over to Ros and Nadine to talk about um, their experiences with apprenticeships. I actually first saw them speak at a conference about three months ago and they were brilliant. They were a fantastic double act on the day. And so I went straight up to them afterwards and said it would be great to bring, um, to bring your experience to the Apprentice Makers community. And they were willing to do it. So I'm so really grateful for them coming along today. Okay, so I'll just um, talk, talk through a few things on Apprentice Makers. Here we go. So as I said, this is the fourth Apprentice Makers live webinar. We've got um, two more in development at the moment. One in the craft sector, which is due to happen in November. There's a provisional date of the 12th of November, but that's not completely confirmed. And uh, one in the design sector. We're going to be doing a, um, a poll with a few design businesses. Um, and with, that work with the Design Business Association to find out the kind of things they're interested in and some of the challenges around apprenticeships and then we're going to run a webinar as a result. If you have businesses that work in that sector that you think um, would be interested in getting involved or if you are a business in that sector that would like to get involved, we'd love to hear from you um, because we're looking for good speakers from the design sector to um, talk about their experiences, the challenges as well as the benefits of taking on apprentices so that we can share that with businesses that are that are new to the whole apprenticeship thing. We've got some more in the car, on the cards in the care sector, health and fitness and farming. Um, so that those are some of those in, in development at the moment, but we're looking for uh, more ideas and we're completely open to ideas in terms of sectors that we haven't covered yet. Okay. Um, so why are we running um, these webinars? Well, the reason we're running them is because Apprentice Makers is all about peer-to-peer -peer sharing of knowledge and experience. So Apprentice Makers was put in place as a result of a report review that was written by Jason Holt that you can see on the screen there. And that review looked at how apprenticeships could be made more accessible to businesses. And one of the things that he recommended was that peer-to-peer -peer support and mentoring would be a great way to encourage businesses to do that. So that can work in many different forms. That might be as simple as a uh, plumber in um, Northampton saying, um, hey, you know, I, I really like the idea of taking the apprentice, don't know how to do it. I'd love to speak to another plumbing business and see how it worked for them. And actually being able to connect in the community and have a conversation that would just get them to that point where they think, right, well, now I know how to get started or now I, I understand how it would work in practice to a more formal mentoring um, relationship where a business might work with a more experienced business for a number of months to kind of work them through the process right from the point at which they're thinking of, of apprenticeships to the point where they've got apprentices in their business and are looking at ways and ideas of how to support them. So that's why Apprentice Makers was put in place and there's lots of things on it now that kind of go above and beyond the whole peer, peer mentoring activity. Um, so I'll just talk you through some of those. So the main objective of Apprentice Makers is about making connections, sharing best practice amongst businesses. And I'm talking here mainly about smaller businesses because those are the businesses that often um, feel like they need, um, the, they need additional support to help them get to the point where they are ready to take on apprentices. Um, the mentoring element um, needed to be there in order to help those businesses make connections and actually start to develop mentoring relationships. Um, asking questions is there, so in terms of a forum, there's, there's a forum there for businesses to ask each other questions. And so that, those might be um, questions such as, anyone know a great training provider in you know, X city? Or anybody um, got any great ideas of how my apprentice can meet other apprentices? 
And so that's a great way to, for businesses to work together, saying, yes, I've got one in the same city, why don't we get them together and they can you know, share ideas, etc. Um, there's an, an opportunity through apprentice makers for people to work together and um, approach things that perhaps they would struggle to approach on their own, such as maybe going to a careers fair or something like that. It might be hugely expensive for a small business. Maybe it would be useful for them to join forces and, and um, attend something like that um, together. And also solving shared challenges. So it might be that um, a couple of businesses really want to raise the profile of the design sector in a particular town and they would like to uh, approach some of the schools and working collaboratively would make that more possible. Um, so those are just some of the ideas, but obviously as an open forum and an open community, people can um, will develop as, as, uh, as their need permits really. So as the community, um, this is how the community looks when you're in there. So that's me at the top there. So um, you go into the community, you can um, search people by location, by whether or not they've taken on an apprentice or they're interested in doing so, and by the sector that they work in. And those sectors map against the um, the uh, sectors that are that form the, the different frameworks at the moment. And as people go through the um, process of getting into apprentice makers, we also have all the kind of drill down sub sub um, sections of that as well, so that it we've got more detail on, on businesses if we need it. Um, it. We can also focus on size of business and on the role within the business. Um, and there's also a map view, so that if you want to um, particularly look at who's there from your city or town or area or region, you can do that. And we've just redeveloped the case study section so that we can really showcase all of the businesses that we've profiled um, through um, apprentice makers and we're always looking for fantastic case studies um, on the actual website there's a tool to search on um, the sector so um, if you uh, work in a particular sector and want to see whether there's a, already been a case study from that sector um, you can use that filter tool and if there isn't then let us know and, and we'll see whether we can um, add you to our list of interviewees okay uh, we've also recently added a small business guide which talks people through the apprenticeship process and talks about the relationship between the businesses and training organisations that they've worked with. And that's brand new and it's going to be something that um, the uh, National Apprenticeship Service is going to be talking about shortly. Um, a new thing on there which is not live yet but it's just for your information is that we have recently started to set up groups on apprentice makers and the idea of this is that particular regions might have people that are really active in that region that really want to try and get a, a um, engage with businesses in the region and by setting up groups that's a way for them to lead group activity there so um, we're starting to think about that and start to explore how that might work would work whether it's by region or by sector and so on so um, you know watch this space for those starting to, to come online and we're open to ideas as well from uh, people that are interested in getting involved in those or perhaps leading the group. So to summarise then, um, Apprentice Maker um, currently has all of these activities on it. So we've got the community, case studies, we've got blogs there um, and we're also looking for ideas for blogs as well. So, so please tweet or email if you've got any thoughts on that. And we've got the upcoming and archived webinar. So now um, every time we run a webinar, it's filmed and it's going into the archive section. So if people miss it on the day, they can still view it afterwards. Um, we've got the small business guide on there and also an interactive small business journey, as well as um, the Apprentice Maker Toolkit, which I'll show you in a minute, which gives people an overview of what Apprentice Makers is all about and lets them take the mentor training. Um, useful links on there and um, the mentor as an apprentice maker activity. So there's an online section there where if people really want to champion apprenticeships as a business and they are interested in mentoring another business in a more formal way, they can go onto the mentor as an apprentice maker plus um, section of apprentice makers and do a really short um, enterprise mentoring course which helps them think about the mentoring role and how they might be able to best support another business. And so um, that's worth looking at for those businesses that are really um, keen to um, support other businesses in their region or sector.
Okay, so when people join Apprentice Makers, um, they get this fantastic app through the post, which has got information about apprenticeships for small businesses and um, a pocket book all about apprentice makers and how you can make the most of it. And these Moo cards, which you'll see on the bottom left there, which um, enable them to take a few of those out with them when they're going to networking events and let other businesses know about them as well. So I think that kind of runs through the, the overview of Apprentice Makers. And as I've been talking, I've noticed that more people have joined us online. So um, I thought I would start the, um, before we get, we, I hand over to Roz and Nadine, I would just get people in the um, frame of mind for asking questions and engaging more in the webinar. So um, we've got a few polls to run to find out um, what's your background, what your background is and whereabouts you are in the apprenticeship process. But just to get you into the um, mood for taking the poll, we're, I'm going to launch one just to find out what's going on in your neck of the woods today. So um, I hope it's all fine where you are, but let's find out. So I'd like to find out what the weather is, where you are today. So this is just a practice with the tool and, um, and see whether we're all used to taking polls uh, in this kind of form. So let's find out how it's going. I'm actually, I'm actually amazed to see that it's um, gorgeous in some parts of the country today. Quite jealous. That's not what it's like here. I think I'm in the grey, grey and more grey category. Is it snowing somewhere? Well, who knew it could snow in October? Wow. I'm lucky that it's not actually that bad yet. Okay, 100% voted. Let me share these results. So pretty even across the board. So it's glorious somewhere and uh, and snowing elsewhere. So that's uh, that's quite surprising to know this country now. Um, right, let's try another one around friendships. So um, what I'd be interested to know is around um, whether you set an, set up an apprenticeship program in your business. So this is going to be particularly useful for Ros and AD, so that they can understand um, the kind of people they're speaking to today. getting there we've got 73 percent voted at the moment see if any last minute votes come in okay we've got both ends of the spectrum that are the most prominent here so let me share this with everyone particularly Ros and Nadine so they can see the kind of people that we uh, we've got online today so we've got um, lots of people with an established program and then um, the next biggest being the not yet and considering it. So this is going to be interesting. Um, I can see then that there's a lot of people there that um, would, would um, also have experience to share with those that are just starting out. So I think that's going to be particularly useful for the Apprentice Makers community um, after the webinar as well. Okay, I'm going to hide that one. I'm going to try one more around what you consider to be the biggest challenges around apprenticeships. So people at the votes are furiously coming in. And having already seen Ros and Nadine's presentation, um, it sounds, it looks to me already that um, there's some, going to be some commonalities between some of the, the um, struggles that they've found as they've taken on offences in their business and those that other people are experiencing. Okay. I think we've nearly got a full house. Has everyone voted? Okay, I'm going to share these results now. So it seems that finding the candidates, it would be interesting to, to see whether this is something particular in the hospitality sector, but finding the candidates and, um, and the, uh, the sourcing of the funding 
seem to be some of the biggest struggles. So it would be really excellent to know whether this is something that Ros and Nadine also find to be the case. Okay, that's it for polls for now. I think at this point, uh, what the best thing to do is probably is for me to um, tell you how the um, questions work. So it would be fantastic as you're listening to Aideen and Rosie's presentations, if you submit questions as we go along. Um, if it's something in particular to what's happening at that moment, then uh, and there's an opportunity, I can try and accept and we can ask a question at that point. If not, I'll save them for the end. But feel free to use the question box on your um, webinar um, toolkit there to submit any questions and I'll make a note of them as we're going. Um, so at this point it would be great to be able to hand over to um, Aideen and Roz. Are you there? Can you hear me? Now I, we, they did actually mute themselves before the... Uh, let me see if I can unmute them there. There we go. Mute themselves before the um, webinar so there was no echo whilst I was talking. So let's see if they, we can unmute now. There we go. Can you hear me, Roz? Yeah, we can hear you. Fantastic. All right, there we go. So is it okay if I hand over to you at this point? Absolutely fine, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. So thank you very much again for agreeing to speak today. And over to you. Lovely. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, firstly, I, whilst Edine and I have presented before, this is the very first time that we've done a webinar, so please excuse us if we're a little uh, hesitant with the technology and everything else. Um, but hopefully we've got something worthwhile to share with you today. Just to um, introduce ourselves, as, as you can see from the screen, my name is Rob Hardiman, and I'm the Human Resources Director at the Royal Garden Hotel in London. And I'm joined by Aideen, who is the HR manager at Lancaster London Hotel. Um, today, really, Aideen and I are just going to give you our perspective on apprenticeships uh, from the point of view of a small or medium-sized employer. Um, I, I think it would be helpful for us to tell you a little about, a bit about our hotels, just so it puts it into context. Um, and then we're going to share our experiences. Um, the Royal Garden Hotel is uh, located in Kensington in London, which is a very leafy and lovely part of London. Um, we are right next door to Kensington Palace, and our neighbours, of course, are William and Kate and Prince George, so, uh, and various other members of the royal family. So we have very uh, high-profile neighbours, uh, amongst others, who live in the area. It's a very affluent part of London, and that obviously has an impact on us from the point of view of recruiting and retaining good staff. The hotel itself has 396 bedrooms, extensive conference facilities, two restaurants, three bars and a health club amongst other things. Um, what's fairly unique about us is that we are an independently owned family business um, and that's uh, a little different to most of the other uh, larger five-star hotels in London. Um, we employ about 350 to 400 people, so technically we're not an SME, but we are a standalone business with no corporate structure behind us to support us. Um, so that means we have to work that bit harder to recruit and retain employees and have a high profile as an employer. And apprenticeships are very much part of uh, our whole strategy uh, surrounding those things. Aideen and I are going to talk fairly generally about our involvement in apprenticeships. It's not vast, it's not unique, but it's probably fairly typical of many other organizations of our size within the hospitality sector, and I'm guessing many other sectors as well. At the Royal Garden Hotel, we've offered chef apprenticeship programs for many years, and we're currently developing other programs in other parts of our business, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Edine's also going to tell you more about our current involvement in the Hospitality and Travel Trailblazer Group, uh, and that's something that we've been um, involved in for a number of months now, and is very much shaping our thoughts for our presentation today. So let me hand over to Edine now to tell you more about herself and give you a bit of background to our industry sector in particular, which you may already be familiar with, but it uh, doesn't do any harm just to recap 
on some of the key points. Thank you. Many thanks, Roz. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to share just some of um, my thoughts on uh, our experiences with uh, apprenticeship schemes in hospitality. I'm happy to be representing uh, an industry that I am truly passionate about. Um, I've worked in four and five star hotels in London since 2001 um, and seen firsthand how the, the journey um, has taken place of apprenticeships in hospitality. Um, in October 2013, we decided to set ourselves the goal of becoming the best apprenticeship hotel in London by our 50th birthday, which is in 2017. Um, so at the Lancaster London, we do a huge amount to drive our corporate social responsibility initiative forward. Um, so it just seems a natural uh, goal to try and change the world a little bit um, and, um, and start an apprenticeship program resulting in becoming the best. Since then, we've developed five new apprenticeship programs for human resources, for finance, front office and reservations, food and beverage, and painting and decorating. Um, like most hotels in London, um, we have a kitchen apprentice um, which runs very, very successfully and it's in its fourth year. Um, in order to encourage hotels and the hospitality industry to start running apprenticeship programs, templates of these programs are available to download and start using today. Um, so these will be made available at the end of the, the webinar for anyone and everyone who wants to use them. So basically what we've done is um, made them generic, so taken out anything, any points to do with the uh, Lancaster London, but made them generic so any hotel or restaurant or um, hospitality um, sector member can use them for the future. So it's just something really that we're, we're passionate about, we want to share this, why do the work again if it's there to share. Um, we have 15 apprentices and 250 permanent employees at the Lancaster at the moment, but we think we can do more. We really want to make this work because we believe in our youth and we believe we can make apprenticeships work in hotels. So apart from trying to bribe you with documentation, I would like to repeat a very interesting fact that I have learned uh, from doing research for this and our speech before um, that Sophie was talking about. Um, but first, I want to explain why you are listening to Roz and I. What do we know? Why should we be discussing our obstacles and opinions? Well, we are from medium-sized companies in the hospitality industry, and we want to see apprenticeships work. And as a result, we want to see apprentices succeed in the industry and hopefully employ new apprentices and so on and so forth. So what about our industry? Since 1998, the hospitality industry contributed to enormous growth for the British economy. Our industry has big aims, and we want to solve some of the existing problems in the UK today. In May 2014, it was reported that there were 970,000 NEETs in the UK. That's just under a million young people without a job or, without, um, or not being on a journey towards a job. Between 2010 and 2012, 153,000 new jobs were created in the hospitality industry, and it forecasts at least 300,000 more new jobs between now and 2020. So does that mean that our industry could solve one-third of the country's unemployment problems? Now, if that isn't something to get excited about, I don't know what is. What is also interesting and not widely appreciated is the fact that we employ chefs, waiters, and room attendants. But we also employ engineers, IT specialists, HR professionals, financial accountants, and marketing executives. We also recruit from within, giving opportunities for growth to our kitchen porters, our housekeeping porters, and room attendants to learn new skills, meaning a lot of our skills members in the team have been promoted from within. In fact, at the Lancaster London 2012, in 2012, a quarter of our permanent employees were promoted. Now, despite these facts and figures, little has changed in the recognition it receives as a career path of choice. Okay, as Aideen says, 
um, we have a bit of an image problem in our sector, and you may well already be aware of this, but this is a constant challenge for us. Um, the perception is still that it's low paid work, it's long hours, it's short term, um, you know, zero hour contracts, all those sorts of things, no long term careers and high turnover of staff. And sadly, many parents, teachers and lecturers seem to perpetuate this myth. I'm not casting aspersions on the whole education sector by any means, but I, even within my own team, one of my staff um, came in and told me of her son who was actually looking for work experience within um, uh, a, an electronics company. Uh, and when he was struggling to find this, his teacher said, well, never mind, you can always get something in a hotel or a restaurant, as if that was the last sort of resort for anybody. Um, this really upsets me, and people that know me know I get very passionate about this. I've worked in the hospitality and leisure sectors for nearly 20 years now, um, and I've worked across the, the industry in um, both leisure operators, golf clubs, hotels, private members clubs, restaurants, everything. And I can give you countless examples of individuals who started at very junior levels and have pursued successful careers. Salaries in excess of 50K are not exceptional and many more senior roles in the hotel and restaurant sectors particularly command well in excess of 100,000 and even 200,000 a year. So this myth about, you know, you can't have a decent career with decent money is just not true. What we have found is that when appointing apprentices, however, we find that there are particular issues surrounding work readiness and skill shortages at entry level. Uh, we struggle to find the right type of, of apprentices to join our businesses. And I think the poll at the beginning of the session showed that, that it's, it's about finding the right people. Um, Aileen's going to, to share some of her experiences in that respect with you. But we're acutely aware of it, and we're working very hard with industry organizations to try and dispel some of the myths and change the perception of our sector and engage with young people in the very early stages of their career planning. So we're now trying to do this at a much earlier stage before people are looking for apprenticeships through um, work experience programs and other um, opportunities to interact with uh, both students and parents uh, before the decisions are made. We believe one way of helping to overcome negative views of our sector is to provide high quality employer-led apprenticeships that meet our specific needs. And broadly speaking, we welcome the reforms that are going on within the apprenticeship uh, arena at the moment. We like the idea of being more in control and, and um, shaping the apprenticeship programs, but we do have some misgivings. I'm going to talk to uh, ask. Uh, Aileen to talk to you now about some of the realities that she's experienced of developing a, a apprenticeship programs in her particular business. Aideen. Thank you, Rose. So earlier on this year, as we began our goal to become the, the best apprenticeship hotel in London, uh, we began recruiting our new apprentices for our operational departments, such as food and beverage, front office and reservations. We advertised our exciting opportunities, feeling confident we would attract a large number of motivated individuals with the right attitude to grab our apprenticeships with both hands. Following three attempts, we finally managed to scrape together enough for our recruitment day um, that we had spent ages planning, expecting you know, in excess of 50 people to, sh to turn up. It was incredible the, um, the lackluster response we actually did receive. Undeterred, however, we chose our six candidates, held the induction, and got them all started. It was the beginning of something great. Um, out of those six, we now have one left. We encountered challenge after challenge, from alarm clocks not going off to not having the right shoes, right through to a series of serious personal problems leading to our apprentices either failing their probation or walking out. What had we done wrong? What will we do differently? 
these five individuals struggled with basic fundamental with the basic fundamental ability to behave in a professional manner and our managers failed to give them the kind of support that they needed okay we're expecting some fallout but 83 percent fallout is that what we should expect in terms of a success rate that is seriously a large amount of time and effort for one in six what we learned is that there is a gap between what young people give and what companies like ours expect. What we struggled with is the lack of pastoral care. Our managers who manage big budgets, sales and marketing campaigns, and large teams of people didn't have the time or expertise or knowledge to support and help, and so the outcome was inevitable. Rod? Okay, but it's not all bad. Um, we, um, despite some of the difficulties that Aileen faced, and I faced similar situations, we have a very successful chef apprenticeship program uh, at both of the hotels. Many people within our kitchens have progressed or gone on to develop highly successful careers elsewhere over the years, and we've recognized that um, being an employer of apprentices is not just about training people to do jobs. It's so much more than that. With our chefs, uh, our chef apprentices, for example, we make a real point of getting to know the parents or guardians and trainers and assessors that are working with the young people. Luckily, at the Royal Garden Hotel, we are able to provide accommodation and meals, which makes a big difference, particularly for people coming into work for the first time in central London. And it just helps to make that transition a little bit smoother. However, what it also means is we become a bit more of a parent figure than just an employer. I'm really lucky in that I have a small HR team that can devote time to our apprentices, but we don't necessarily have the resources to navigate all the complexities of funding, frameworks, assessment, etc. And this is the reality for many smaller employer, uh, employers. We just don't have the time or the expertise. Um, and it's one of the things that gives us a particular challenge, is just navigating our way around the minefield of apprenticeship frameworks and understanding how everything um, comes into place. We've come to recognize that we can't do it all alone. And we've developed some very successful partnerships with a number of organizations, including colleges, universities, and independent training providers. And that, to us, is an essential part of us having successful apprenticeships. I mentioned earlier that we've been developing some new programs. One of the things we're looking at, or we've just put into place, is a housekeeping apprenticeship program. Uh, in collaboration with three other five-star hotels. Uh, we're calling this our Top Stars HK program. And this is very much a bespoke program that's designed to develop housekeeping skills within a luxury hotel environment. And that's very much an employer-led program. It's still very, very early days. And we're, in, um, we're experiencing some of the teething problems that uh, Aideen's described in terms of work readiness and skill shortages. Um, but we do believe it's worthwhile investing time and resources in developing these sorts of programs for the longer term benefit of the business. Um, I'm going to ask Aideen now just to talk to you a little bit more about our involvement in the Trailblazers initiative. This is something that, again, is shaping our thoughts going forward as to how we structure our apprenticeships and how we're going to have to do things to make them work in the future. Great. Thank you. Um, just before I go on to the trailblazers, I just really wanted to uh, share some of the, the learnings as well that we've had in the eight months since um, uh, we began to, to recruit for these operational departments and you know this fallout that we experienced. Um, and I, I just wanted to you know share some thoughts that we've had since then um, so, so definitely we've learned to um, that there's no point if you don't have the, the team and the managers um, buy-in and support for the actual um, success of this apprenticeship scheme then it's not going to work we really need to have the the managers and 
you know, all of the team really understanding that this isn't someone who's just going to come in who's been recruited and who will just um, start working along with the team. They need more support. They need more time. They've just come out of school, so that's one point that really needs to be driven home. Um, also, at recruitment stage as well, some of the things that we learned was um, the people who, the, the candidates for the, the scheme, who say, you know, they want to, they just, they really want a job, uh, they, they want to, um, yeah, we found that the people who just said they wanted a job weren't the right candidates. It might seem simple, but um, it's just something to, to bear in mind. Also, be very clear with your expectations, um, and don't expect them to, you know, to understand the timekeeping, that attendance, that uniform, that all those simple things are a given. They need more explanation, um, especially if you're, you're thinking 16, 17-year-olds. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they won't have, um, have to have that experience, so it's not a given. Um, we found as well that they, they like to be included in less of the mundane tasks. Of course, we all do, I hear you say. Um, but, you know, involve them, ask them their opinions, they have great new insights. Isn't that why we're getting um, apprentices, and apprentices involved? They're young, they've got a different take on life, on things, so, so use that experience and, you know, their, their whole approach to everything will change and will, will open up. This is what we've experienced. Um, we have also um, started to, to buddy them up, to, to have a, a mentorship program with them. So I think for the, the 16, 17-year-olds, they see their manager as someone, you know, way over there, nothing in common with them, um, you know, there's this big divide, they shout at me if I'm not on time, etc. So, you know, I'm not going to talk to them about my, my issues or my, my ideas or, or anything. So. We have, in, um, in our business, we have a supervisor junior manager program called Future Leaders that we've been running since last year, which is an apprenticeship for, you know, the leaders of the future, hence the name. So um, as part of their development, we have asked them to mentor our apprentices. Um, and we've already seen that those relationships have really, um, really flourished, and the, the apprentices have a an option to talk to them to, to see and be inspired by someone who's already on the journey uh, to becoming a leader and hopefully you know some of their excitement rubs off. Um, Roz also mentioned the, the involvement of um, the parents, the guardians. Again, I'll just reiterate how important that we found. Um, you know, last week actually we had our um, apprenticeship family day where we invited all of our apprentices to bring parents, a guardian, brother and sister, cousin, even a friend, just someone who, you know, can, can come in, see how the hotel works, see what the expectations are, see the opportunity that these individuals have been given, so with a, a hope that if they're, you know, in bed late and the, you know, as the parent they know that they need to be at work because, um, you know, that's our expectation, then they will be in a better position, you know, to say, come on, you're supposed to be at work, let's go. So um, it worked really well. We, um, we involved the general manager and a number of our mentors and the management team to really get everyone involved. Um, and, and so uh, those are just some of the ideas. And also the, the strength of the relationship with the, the training providers, the colleges, um, right up to uh, you know, allowing colleges to, to award um, uh, the students uh, to, to be involved in our benefit scheme, for instance. So, um, you know, rewarding people. Um, I don't think I made that point very, very intellectually. So the importance of having a relationship is there, but also to include them um, in all parts of the, um, of the business as well, so that your training providers, your colleges, um, you know, there isn't this big divide between what they learn at college and what they learn at the hotel. So there's, it's more seamless. So sorry about that. Um, I got there eventually. So back to trailblazers. Um, as Roz mentioned, uh, this is something that um, Roz and I have been heavily involved in. So the, the story goes from the beginning um, that our uh, attention was, was led to this trailblazers happening. So trailblazers uh, two started in uh, December last year. So the trailblazers um, two concentrated on among other industries, the hospitality industry. 
And so there was a bid to get involved. And um, the Enterprise People First um, were leading that, that bid. And so they attracted different companies to come on to, to join a, a consortium which looked at um, you know, how an employer would um, build a, an apprenticeship program. Um, however, because um, we heard that it was all the, the huge companies like Whitbread, like uh, McDonald's, uh, Sodexo were involved, there wasn't actually a small hotel, small hospitality um, company involved. So we thought that it would be really beneficial to, to put our hat in the ring to say, listen, uh, we'd like to, to make up a, a small and medium enterprise consortium um, and then feedback our thoughts and attend this Trailblazers as well. So that's what's happened. Um, and we found that uh, we've had you know, various uh, successes with it. Uh, we started off as a very small consortium. However, we are growing. And with that, we have more opinions and more expertise and more um, way to the vice and the, um, the support that we give to the trailblazers. Um, the thing I need to kind of clarify is that at the moment trailblazers too, we're just looking at apprenticeship standards at, at quite a senior level. So, so we're looking at chef standards for kind of sous chef level and for um, hospitality supervisors and managers. So as yet, we're not really looking at you know, the entry-level apprenticeship programs. Um, but it is, it is an interesting and, um, I suppose, fulfilling uh, initiative that we're involved in. And the, the next um, set of Trailblazers 3, which will be starting in the new year, um, then we'll start looking at the, the more junior standards. And you know, it'll be then where we can you know, really look at improving um, how apprenticeships are um, and, you know, all of that. So um, I think that's all I have to say about apprenticeships, apart from if there is anyone on the webinar who wishes to know more or to get involved in our small and medium hospitality consortium, um, please do email me or get in touch with Sophie. Um, to get my email details because we meet probably once um, every couple of months. We look at what's being discussed um, and if anyone has a, a strong opinions or a desire to get involved and you know we're, we're really an open consortium and, and we'd love to, to hear from you. Um, so I'm passing back to Ross. Lovely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. As Aideen says, the, our involvement in Trailblazers um, we feel is an important part of us as understanding how apprenticeships can work in our business going forward. So if you're not already doing apprenticeships and perhaps thinking about it, it's a good way to get involved and find out what is happening uh, with apprenticeship frameworks and also feel that things are going to be listened to for, from your type of business. So do get involved um, if you think that would be of interest. I hope, or we both hope, that you found this insight into our businesses interesting. As I said at the beginning, there's nothing unique or um, particularly groundbreaking about what we're doing. Whilst we're, we're very proud ourselves of, of what we're, we've achieved, we're definitely not um, you know, in the same uh, arena as some of the much larger organizations who uh, run massive apprenticeship programs. And we're learning from them as well as we go. Um, we believe our experience is probably very similar to other SMEs um, and I think it's just worth talking about these things and sharing knowledge uh, just to make things better within your own business. Um, I hope you found it worthwhile uh, and I'll be interested to see if anybody has got any questions about what we've talked about today um, or alternatively if you'd like to contact us offline. Uh, as Aideen said, we'd be happy to share more experiences and um, answer any questions. So many thank you, uh, thanks to everybody today. I'll hand back to Sophie Great. and uh, hopefully get to talk to you again very soon. Brilliant. Thank you, Ros. Thank you, Aideen.
That was uh, great and uh, just as I remember it from the conference being really insightful and really interesting about um, your experiences. Um, I must apologise for the slide because once they were off, they were off and I couldn't stop them <laughs> and so they raced off at a speed which meant that we missed some of the fantastic shots but um, just to... Um, just so that you can help me understand what's going on in some of these pictures, Edine and Roz. Um, the first photo is of, is of these chaps. I'm going to race them again, sorry, but just because they kind of whizzed past and we didn't see what was quite happening. Um, it, I'm guessing this is a bunch of apprentices that have set up their own football team in your in your business. Is that right, Edine? Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> this is a, a group of our employees with, I think we've got three of the apprenticeships there. They can demonstrate how they've integrated really well into the team. Um, so actually, they, they won this. This is a hotel, um, London-wide hotel tournament that's run every year. And our Lancaster Bees won the tournament um, throughout the year this year. So we were very proud of them. Fantastic. Yay. And I think that's really, <laughs> I'll, I'll go the other way again. I know people have seen these a few times. And I, I, I'm sorry if it was confusing for people. We did have a bit of a technical blip with them whizzing past. But, um, um, I think it's really interesting that because I think one of the things that would probably help a smaller business that's taken on an apprentice retain them is those individuals feeling part of a team, not just literally like this, but in terms of them being able to, you know, connect with their the peers in the hotel, but also meet other apprentices from other businesses. And I think that's one way in which apprentice makers, but also other, you know, activities out there that training organisations put together to help their employees connect, employers connect rather are really useful for helping those businesses keep those apprentices in place. Um, uh, this is some apprentices at one of your garden parties, I can take it? Uh, that was actually a springboard event called Waiters Day. Right. Um, you probably know the, the charity Springboard. We work uh, very closely with them. So mm -hmm. that was Stephen on the right with the tray, um, who's our food and beverage um, apprentice. Um, okay. None of them won, unfortunately. They weren't fast enough. Right. Oh yeah. It was prize for fastest way there. You had to uh, run with a, a tray and a glass and a bottle. Um, and then I think there was one for best dressed as well. But it was the participation that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And they, these slides are off again. So obviously there's a bugging machine. It's determined to to, uh, <laughs> to go this way. So I'll let you go with it. If there's anything you want to say in them as we move past, that would be great. We've had lots of questions that have come in. Um, one of the first questions was asking whether the documents that you mentioned, Adina, are going to be available. Um, yes, they are. Adina's already sent them over to me, and um, I'll make them available on the Apprentice Makers site. Um, if you can't Thank access you. them, then feel free to email me, and I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, but that's something that I'll be letting people know about after the event. Um, I've got, um, I'll just run through some of the questions that are here. Someone's asked, as a small business, I'm concerned about having to make a cash contribution to the new apprenticeship program. I will pay wages and support training, but having to pay cash to get an apprentice seems wrong to me. What's your view in that? Because I know this relates to the apprenticeship reforms and the, the funding reforms. Um, is, is this necessarily the case that small businesses are going to have to make a cash contribution? Um, so at the moment, it's still being decided. I think every week there's a, a new article that comes out um, which says, oh, the apprentices have no future because small employers won't be able to get involved because of that exact reason. Um, and you're, you're quite right. I think you're, you wouldn't be in the minority if it was the case that um, this um, this funding decision was made. So as I understood it during the summer, it was um, widely um, believed that the, the government said, okay, we, we no longer think that um, apprentices should be um, just employed and the government pays for all the training. <clears throat> uh, so it, instead they have said that, you know, they've capped different, um, they, they've placed a, a figure on different amounts of our different apprenticeships and the government will pay two-thirds of the amount and then an employer is expected to pay one-third. Uh, so every two pounds that the government invests in training, an employer is expected to, to pay one pound. <clears throat> so this would um, cut out some employers 
who just would feel, oh well, I'm not. Um, I'll just employ someone who's ready to work. Why should I um, go ahead and, and start putting money down when, you know, especially when you think about the high turnover and all those things. So um, I, I can't say no. You've got to do it anyway because. I don't believe that most companies are in a position to make that decision. We've all got managing directors who look at the bottom line and say, hang on a second, what are you, what are you trying to do to us? Um, however, the latest that I've heard is that that is under um, discussion again at government level, so um, it might not all be, be lost yet. Yeah, I think that's one of the key things, is that the apprenticeship reforms aren't confirmed, are they? And from that conference that we went to, um, where we were talking about apprenticeship funding, it seemed that the smaller businesses, there were some safeguards in place to make sure that they weren't going to be, um, it, it wasn't going to be an additional, there wasn't going to be more costs than they currently you know, outlay. But I think that's still, you know, it's, it's a tricky one because I think nobody quite knows yet how they're going to pan out. Um, we have put together yeah. a blog around apprenticeship reform and we would welcome people's thoughts on that. It's not live yet, it's going to be going live in the next week um, and it's really just to provide a kind of overview for small businesses about what the funding, you know, how, how it's going to work and how what it means for businesses. But we like, um, you know, most people are still waiting to see how it's all going to work. So we welcome the question on it and we welcome mm -hmm. anything that would help small businesses yeah. understand how it might impact them. We are, you know, we're keen to know about it and to share it, so um, we will try and keep businesses informed on that. Have you got any? So, just one more thing on on that, if I may. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we have our, our small and medium enterprise consortium, and that would be the exact kind of thing that we'd be bringing up in that forum. Um, obviously, there's power in numbers, so the more people who raise that concern, the less likely the governments are going to. Um, make sure that it happens. So uh, please do get in touch, get involved, um, because we will be, you know, it's not just that we sit around drinking tea and talk about things. We want things to change, so we will be in a position to, to make noise and to, to make those changes and opinions heard. Yeah, yeah. One idea then um, might, might be to set up um, a hospitality, small business and medium-sized business uh, group on apprentice makers, if that's useful. And then that's um, people that are interested in that and have a, have views on it um, can join that. So that's my, maybe something we talk about um, afterwards. If that's something okay. that's useful for the hospitality sector. Um, uh, and that next question is: um, Should some sort of pastoral care be built into the core requirements for employers? I think that's a really uh, interesting question, and uh, as I was saying, you know, that that throughout all of our um, planning of apprenticeship programs, it's been something that comes up time and time again, is that you do need to offer that sort of pastoral care uh, much more than you would with uh, other employees. And I suppose it's thinking back to apprenticeships in you know, days gone by, and I, I always use my dad as a, a good example. My dad left school and started an apprenticeship in engineering, and his father actually had to pay for him to do that apprenticeship, and it was really hard to get in to do the apprenticeship, but there was a really strong link with the family, um, and, it, you know, that's how apprenticeships always were. It was very much um, you know, the, there was always that family involvement right from the beginning. Um, you know, times have changed and expectations are different, but we really do feel that giving that extra support is a fundamental part of it. The difficulty is we've all got businesses to run, uh, and particularly in the hotel and hospitality sector, you know, we can only be as helpful uh, as we can in the uh, the constraints of our business. You know, we need staff on duty at certain times of the day. If they don't turn up, it causes problems. And we can be flexible and we can try and understand the issues that some of our young people are facing, 
but ultimately we still got to staff our business and run our business. Mm -hmm. So it's a really fine line, but I would strongly advise people to really think through that side of things and also just you know, look at where else you can get support, whether it's from colleges, training providers, other organizations that might be able to help um, with that pastoral care as well. Yeah, yeah. I guess for a smaller business, some of the challenges that you highlighted there with recruiting apprentices and then many of them leaving, that that would be, you know, just difficult to sustain for a small business. They, they would really struggle with that. So um, have you, did you learn anything particularly on that journey that you would recommend for small businesses? What's the, what's the main thing they can do to not find themselves in the same boat, really, in terms of taking people on and then, you know, spending time with them and then those people leaving? Have you got any thoughts? I, I think it depends on what you want to achieve because there, there's the one hand of one handful of people that will say, okay, well, you know, decide at the beginning that there will be you know, a difference between your expectations of apprentices and um, direct hire employees. Uh, so that, okay, you know, if I employed someone as, you know, shift leader at a reception um, and they were late for the first, you know, three days or three times in a month something, then, you know, we would be in a, a probation review meeting seriously discussing whether they would continue. Do we, you know, some companies might decide, well, you make those exceptions for apprentices because they're apprentices. Um, it, it just really has to be a, a decision you make because it's not going to be, you know, plain sailing. They're not going to come in ready and, and you know, all guns blazing, suited and booted. You just have to, to make those concessions and understand and get your managers, your team members to realize that as well. Mm -hmm. I think there is also a lot to be said for getting involved with um, schools or other educational establishments at an early stage, maybe even a couple of years out before you even think of, of taking apprentices because it's all about this perception of the world of work and, and you know, that includes the more mundane aspects of work like having to turn up and uh, attend work, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you can start working with students a lot earlier on, whether it's through work experience or other initiatives, just going into schools and giving careers talks. You know, all of those things start to um, get people ready for apprenticeships, which is what it's all about. Um, there's, a, there's a few more questions, but I know we're running out of time. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I've tried to distill them into this area, which is around training providers. Um, how helpful is your training provider to you and how um, much is the responsibility of supporting the apprentices on them? Do they take the sum of that on when you're going through the process? Um, okay, so the, the first question was how supportive the training providers are. Yeah. I think the, the key is to, you know, really set your soul out early and, and have a combined kind of goal uh, when it comes to apprenticeship uh, with your training provider have an understanding, make sure that they realize your expectations and then it can't fail. Um, we're lucky, I'm lucky enough at the Lancaster to work with a, a great training provider. I know she's uh, listening to the webinar today. Uh, so hi Adele um, <laughs> and her company is called Umbrella Training. Um, so we work with them very closely, um, you know, and, and we're looking at not just working together with apprenticeships but other training as well. So that's, you know, it's all about meaningful relationships and being honest with one another um, and asking for help when you need it. Um, we also work with um, Westminster, uh, sorry, West London College for our, um, our chef's apprentice, highly successful, very well integrated. Um, Karen from there is heavily involved. Uh, she attended our family day recently as well just to you know, strengthen, the, strengthen the link. Um, and yeah, a very positive relationship. Again, that's been through constant communication, um, and you know, they're just a great college, and, and they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, we work with um, sorry, not finally. We have Lambeth College for our painting and decorating um, apprenticeships, which works really, really well. Um, and finally, BPP College for our um, accountant and human resources apprenticeship, mm -hmm. um, which 
uh, we don't really need a huge amount of pastoral care and connection when it comes to those two. For some reason, I suppose, because they're both in offices, they're both um, heavily tasked, and you know, there's always someone looking at them, I suppose. Um, it does seem to work very well. They go off for a week at a time and do, do their courses, do their exams. So we've got two A students there. Um, so I guess it's um, you know, a collection of different uh, training providers and colleges that, have, um, that work for us. So it, it's about finding the right mix, I suppose, and depending on the, the apprenticeship, um, you know, making those decisions. Yeah, I would say like any business partnership, it's about finding organizations that understand what you're looking for, um, but also that you, you feel that you can work with them on a long-term basis. I think, um, you know, we, we have similar partnerships to Lancaster London. Um, we work with a number of colleges and other training providers, and it takes time to build up a solid relationship with those organizations. And you do make mistakes along the way, but ultimately um, you, you've got to work out that something that meets everybody's objectives, um, and it is a collaboration. That's what it's all about. I think the problem has been with apprenticeships in the past. It's very much been training provider-led, and employers really haven't got as actively involved in shaping their apprenticeship programs as they should have. It's almost been a reactive thing, and I, I would strongly advise, you know, taking your time, getting it right before you embark on things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's great. Even though there's more questions here, I think maybe I'll have a chat with you afterwards about how, whether we can cover some of these when we interview for, you for case studies, because I think we're going to put uh, our case study writer in contact with you to find out more about your journey, if that's okay. And we'll cover some of the, um, these questions in that so that we can um, um, cover the things that people are interested in. And we've had some great feedback and we've had some um, people saying they love the idea of a family day and that's something that they would love to incorporate in their business as well. And so um, lots of learning happening today. I think um, I'll just launch this last poll to see where people found um, most benefit from, from today's session. Here we go. So what you found uh, most useful from today's session would be great to know. And I'll also be sending a feedback form after the uh, webinar to find out um, specifically what you found useful and what you'd like to see in future webinars. Um, it would be great to get your feedback generally and to, um, to see whether there's any elements that you'd like to work with us on on future webinars. And feel free to get in touch about anything you've, you've um, heard today or any areas that you think you'd like to work with in the future. Let's see. So unsurprisingly, it's hearing how other businesses have developed their um, apprenticeship programs, um, understanding more about the challenges, and understanding more about trailblazers. And um, I think, you know, I've, I've interviewed lots and lots of businesses now about how apprenticeships have worked in their business and every single time I learn something new and something interesting which really helps um, you know formulate how apprentices can work in a business so um, I don't think there's, there's any kind of limit to how much benefit you can gain from um, learning from other businesses um, I'd really like to thank Ros and Nadine for their time today uh, it's been incredibly useful as I knew it would be and um, if anybody's got any questions, they are very welcome to email me after this session, and I'm happy to forward questions on to them if you're happy to receive them. Um, the um, feedback form should be coming in about an hour after the session, so it'd be great if you could just take five minutes to have a look at that. Um, the film from today's webinar will be put into the archive as soon as we can make that happen, along with the presentation from today, perhaps not going at the speed that it did during this session, so I do apologise for any uh, any uh, blips there. Um, and the documents that um, Adeem has sent over to me to share with other businesses, so they'll be um, available as well. Um, thanks again, Ros and Adeem, for your time. Um, it's really appreciated, and I hope that you found it interesting and useful as well. Are they on? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to close the session now. Thanks again, everyone, for attending. See you at the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.